Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 22nd, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain our significant concerns about the recent passage by House Ways and Means of a bill cutting the state's corporate income tax rate. Second, now that it's clear that the governor's carbon bills aren't going to produce the revenues he anticipated, we ask when he is going to offer a realistic fiscal plan for the state. And third, we discuss what we learned from our recent debate with John Sims of NSTAR about Cook Inlet gas. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get to it, though, and start talking about it. You've got some uh, interesting things to talk about today. I know you had a good discussion um, in that landmine um, uh, debate with John Sims, or interview, I guess, whatever it was. Uh, and then we're going to get to that here in a little bit, but, uh, we'll start off with, uh, the cart before the fiscal horse. Um, and uh, let's get started there. So I've got to give Ben Carpenter, uh, a lot of credit, um, uh, as, as we go into this, because I'm going to complain about him in just a moment, but I got to start, start with giving him a lot of credit. Uh, he writes a, he, he and the entire Kenai, uh, delegation, uh, write, uh, a, uh, a column each week for the. Peninsula Clarion, um, which is a summary of, of he and Justin Ruffridge and and, uh, and Jesse Bjorkman's uh, views on what uh, what what happened during the week in Juneau and what's in the what's in the week upcoming. And Ben's uh, it's called the Capital Corner. And Ben's column uh, this week, uh, written last week, but but for the week ahead, um, uh, you, you took, was a was a brave man. Uh, the second paragraph says this week. I want to talk about tax structure. While it might not be the most riveting topic at first glance, I urge you to pause and consider something. Within the intricacies of tax reform lies the key to unlocking Alaska's potential for robust economic growth. And and Ben went ahead in that column to talk about uh, his HB, uh, what is it? HB 109, which is his proposal uh, to reduce corporate income taxes, and explained that his proposal to reduce corporate income taxes was was an is an effort to unlock um, uh, corporate attention to uh, Alaska. Uh, corporate uh, Alaska corporate income taxes are among the highest, if not the highest, um, in the nation. They're a graduated rate, so you pay more. Progressive rate, so you pay more. Uh, the more uh, the more the corporation has an in income. Um, and Ben's analysis has been, and I think it's a fair analysis, has been that that is one of the things that inhibits uh, corporations from looking to Alaska as a as a potential potential home and a potential market uh, for uh, for uh, for their manufacturing and for and for other things. Um, and so his proposal, his proposed HB 109, uh, is to reduce the corporate income tax, re- uh, eliminate the the progressivity of it and and bring it down to a flat tax uh, of 2% uh, of income. Generally speaking, a good proposal. Here's the problem with it. It costs 300 some odd million dollars uh, in terms of lost revenue or reduced revenue uh, that we would, uh, that the state would, would get out of it. And there's really no 
sensible claim that that amount would be made up by new corporate activity, at least not in the near or intermediate term. Maybe over the longer term, people can claim that, but but certainly not over the near or intermediate term. And Ben hasn't Ben hasn't made that claim. It's just let's get this structure right and let's attract additional corporate activity to Alaska and um, and we'll but go the from there. The implication is is that down the road it will generate an overall kind of more business and activity and things like that. And maybe that will offset. Is that kind of the implication? Maybe, although he's really never made that claim and he doesn't make that claim in the column. What HB 109 was at the beginning was one half of two bills. Uh, HB 109 was the uh, corporate tax, uh, the reduction, and then HB 142 was Ben's proposed sales tax. And basically what Ben proposed to do was implement a state sales tax um, and use a portion of the revenues to restructure the tax code and reduce the corporate income tax, reduce Alaska's reliance on on among the highest, if not the highest uh, corporate tax in the nation, uh, reduce reliance on that and and offset that by a broad-based uh, sales tax that would include uh, receipts from from non-residents. The and and that sales tax based upon the Department of Revenue's analysis was going to net a billion one, a billion two on an annual basis. You deduct the or you remove the the corporate income tax restructuring and you get down to eight hundred million dollars net gain. Uh, for the state in terms of revenue, which would then be used not to increase spending, but would then be used to substitute for for PFD taxes, most regressive tax ever proposed, to to substitute for PFD taxes and be able to increase the PFD. Um, and so the 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 combination of the two, the combination of the sales tax and the corporate tax, or the combination of the three rather, the 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 sales tax using a portion of the proceeds to offset the sales or the a reduction in the corporate income tax and the remainder of the proceeds to offset the PFD tax uh, was net progressive for the state. I mean, sales taxes are still regressive, but they're a heck of a lot regressive, heck of a lot less regressive than PFD cuts. And so we were going to have a net progressive, a net, a net positive uh, gain uh, in state revenue. But the sales tax died a long time ago. Ben brought it up in committee um, and could not get the Republican votes uh, for uh, the sales tax uh, in committee. And so it's just sat there just sort of dead, uh, sit, sitting on the table, just, you know, withering away. Um, and, and, and I thought with that, so would the corporate income tax, if the corporate income tax change would, would just sort of sit there with its, with its mate, with its pair mate uh, and, and, and die away. However, uh, Ways and Means took up the corporate income tax reform um, and passed it out <laughs> without uh, the sales tax. So the net of what's going to uh, House Finance out of Ways and Means out of this package is is the is the tax reduction in corporate income taxes, the minus three hundred plus million dollars in corporate income tax reduction, uh, no uh, uh, offset in terms of sales tax, and no. Uh, 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 positive impact on PFD taxes. Indeed, if anything, by creating an even deeper uh, uh, deficit, the three hundred million dollars, uh, the the, the three hundred plus million dollars tax reduction as a result of the corporate tax would increase PFD cuts because you've got to you've got to you've got to offset the offset the revenue drop someplace, and so uh, it would increase PFD cuts. So it we we took we, we had the we have the worst possible outcome uh, of, of, of where this thing started out right. in terms of tax reform. Uh, and, uh, and, we're, and we've now sent to House Ways and Means. It, it's, it's a lot like, you know, wanting your dessert, <laughs> not only before dinner, but in lieu of dinner, uh, not only in lieu of this dinner, but in lieu of dinner for the next, you know, so many years. And, and this is where I'm going to fault Ben. I, 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 I think it's great that that he has thought through carefully and designed a tax reform package that that in his view and I think fairly so would make Alaska more competitive. But moving one piece of it, um, just like if you move the sales tax alone and left the corporate tax behind, moving one piece of it 
is not true tax reform. And so I'm going to fault fault him as chairman for allowing that one piece to move. Uh, and I'm going to fault him, frankly, as an author of the Peninsula Clarion article for not using that opportunity to explain the overall tax reform. What, what that column did was explain all the benefits out of corporate tax, it, out of overall tax reform. What that column did was explain the benefits of corporate tax reduction, but it didn't go ahead and say, look, we got to have our peas and carrots along with dessert. Uh, and we've got to have uh, uh, revenue to offset that. And we need to, and we need additional revenue to offset the PFD tax. I mean, do you think that he passed this out of? Uh, you think he passed this out on its own? Because I mean, essentially, it's been nearly impossible to pass any kind of connected pieces together. Was he maybe you know trying to get this one and then he'll come back for another bite or what? I mean, what do you you know? We, we've tried, right? I mean, they said, you said single subject. You can only do one thing. You can only do this. You can only do that. They wanted to put together a cohesive package. But, you know, is this just the way it has to be? Well, I mean, that's a question better put to Ben than, than put to me. But but I don't think I don't think Ben's saying he certainly didn't say it in the article. And certainly there's nothing around this process that indicates that this is, hey, I'm going to get corporate tax reform out there. Uh, and then I'm going to drag sales taxes along with, I'm going to get sales taxes out of the committee. I mean, sales taxes hasn't even been discussed in front of the committee for a substantial period of time. And I think what this was, was, look, you know, this is a piece. It's the most attractive piece. It's the piece I can get out of the committee. Uh, and so, and so let's go ahead and get it out there, but it cannot stand alone. That piece cannot stand alone. I, I will be shocked if, if it, and 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 shocked at the irresponsibility of House Finance, uh, if they put that out on the floor, uh, and I will be shocked if how if the House floor would pass it, and I'd be shocked if the if the Senate would pass it. But if they do, if they pass just corporate tax reform, what that is also is an increased PFD cut uh, of about the same amount because we're not th this legislature is not going to cut spending. This governor doesn't even doesn't even isn't even taking the steps to cut spending that substantially. So this is this is in in my opinion not only putting the cart way the hell before the horse, but but I, I hesitate to say this, but it's irresponsibly talking about tax reform um, in, in a way that it in a way that's irresponsible. I mean you cannot talk about overall tax reform without putting the peas and carrots parts with the dessert part. This is certainly a dessert part, certainly right. a Reagan, if you cut taxes, they will come part. But in the current situation that Alaska is facing, it's irresponsible because it ends up in additional PFD cuts. Your your advice would have been to stick on the sales tax issue until it actually moved out and then, then come to the corporate tax part. Is that what you're saying? I would have moved them together. I would have moved them as a pair. And I would explain them as a pair. I mean, my advice would have been, yes, to discuss it in committee as a pair to say we're not going to we're not going to pass our dessert portion uh, until we pass uh, the peas and carrots portion until we until we pass the whole meal. And my advice would have been, you know, I, I, I'm sure Ben's not Ben's not going to appreciate this, but my advice would have been in the column in the in the in Peninsula Clarion. If you're going to discuss this issue, discuss it as a whole. Take the opportunity to educate your your constituents as a whole. The tax reform just cannot just mean tax reductions in one area. It has to be offset by tax increases, uh, offsetting tax increases in another area. And that this, this bill passed alone is offset by tax increases in another area in terms of PFD cuts, in terms of the most regressive tax ever proposed. Right. So it's, it, it I, I understand, I, it, it, believe me, I, I support the proposition that we have to have overall tax reform. I support the proposition that part of that overall tax reform uh, should be corporate reduction in corporate taxes to make Alaska uh, more attractive as a home for as a home and, and place to do business for corporations. I understand that. I accept that. I support that. But in our current environment, you can't do that without at least offsetting revenues, if not additional revenues. And, and moving this without the sales tax bill, I think, is as I said, irresponsible. Uh, Donna says house GOP cuts PFD instead of a long-term fiscal plan. House Dems choose to vote down HJR seven constitutionalizing the PFD 
So that's where we are. And she's not wrong. I mean, you know. Yeah, that's where we are. But but in that environment, going ahead and passing a, a corporate income tax cut uh, just adds to the problem. It doesn't help solve the problem. It adds to the problem by creating an even bigger deficit. And so you've got HJR seven down the tubes. You've got PF. You got you got a full PFD down the tubes. And now you're just adding your by by passing this bill alone. You're just adding to the deficit. So I, that's that's where I think, yeah, your responsibility comes in. Kevin says no one outside of the Michael Duke show wants to cut spending. Out of all the people in my office in the last two years, I've had almost no one except AFP advocating for less spend. In fact, they mostly said to me more money. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? I mean, that's what we've become. We've become the world's largest piggy bank and, and gift giver and allowance giver, you know, I need so, more. So why in that environment are you voting for, voting for additional, uh, additional revenue cuts? I mean, why? Because we know where the marginal source of revenue is going to come. It's going to come from additional PFD cuts. So why in that environment where everybody wants more money, are we voting for revenue cuts? Uh, from corporations, uh, knowing that it translates immediately into uh, the, the tax that or additional tax that has the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. I understand all that. I understand Donna. I understand Kevin. I understand Ben's article. But corporate income tax reduction is part of a piece. You pull it out and you pass it separately. And that's irresponsible because it's going to be made well, up by PFD cuts. It kind of falls back into the whole thing that the fiscal policy working group said to begin with. It cannot be piecemeal. It has to be holistic. You can't do just one because one thing will get changed and it'll jerk the whole pattern out of the skew. And then you won't be able to get the other things. And that, and you know, but again, then they've got stumbling blocks of single subject rule and they can't do all this stuff together. So, I mean, is anybody really serious? The answer is no, nobody's really serious about a long-term fiscal plan. Now, maybe again, maybe Ben, but I mean, you know, for the most part, the majority of everybody down there, they don't give to, they just, they don't care. But, but in the midst, in the midst of that, you don't make it worse. As a responsible legislator, you don't make it worse. You don't say, oh, oh, it's all falling apart anyway. So, hey, let me grab my share while it while it goes out the door. I mean, you don't make it worse. You, you continue to work to make it better. You continue to take opportunities like Ben's column in the, in the Peninsula Clarion to explain why it needs to be holistic, to explain why there needs to be a whole pattern and why corporate tax reduction is a piece of that pattern to make Alaska more competitive. I get that. It's a great storyline, but that it's only a piece of the whole. It's not an end in and of itself. All right. What else we got here? Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, the this, well, I, for a second, I hate to, I don't want to belabor it, but going back to what Kevin just said before, this is exactly what John Coghill told me 15, 20 years ago, this is exactly what every T Tammy Wilson said the same thing. People show up and they don't want less. They want more for themselves, for their constituents, for their special interests, for their kids or hockey team or whatever the hell it is that they're there for. Nobody that we have become uncle sugar. We have become all things to all people. And, and that, that just, it can't continue. And, and Donna just said, something that I think is uh, right here. If Alaska, uh, if Alaska focused on energizing a private economy, the entire math problem would change, but that's the problem. The economy has been totally waved into the, I mean, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. the private yeah, economy yeah. means nothing because they don't draw from it. So why should they care? Yeah, I, right? I agree. I, yeah. I agree. It would change, but, but we have to do it as a, as a whole, we can't do it in pieces, parts. Yeah, exactly. Let's get back over to Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're on to number two of the weekly top three. Will the governor actually come up or does he have, or is it there even an interest to have a fiscal plan? Brad, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious at this point. So I'm going to take us back to, to January of 2023, a little more than a year ago when the governor introduced the fiscal year 2024 budget. A piece of that budget uh, was a uh, a bill uh, uh, that the governor introduced, or a package of bills, uh, to uh, the headline on the on the governor's press release was Governor Dunleavy introduces carbon management and monetization bills, creating statutory structures. 
Um, and it goes on to uh, talk about the, the carbon sequestration bills and other carbon bills that the governor had introduced at the time. These bills were supposedly the backup to the, to the revenue uh, that had been included in the 10-year forecast, OMB's 10-year forecast, that, that inserted $900 million, up to $900 million per year over the, over the, over the 10-year forecast period. These bills were going to generate, were, were alleged to, to, they're going to generate the $900 million uh, that, the, uh, that, the, that the state was going to get from these sorts of activities. Indeed, Governor uh, Dunleavy said at the time, January 2023, we've been told by some that we can generate revenue in the billions over 20 years just from our forest lands. And then went, to, went on to talk about how that, how the, the stuff from carbon sequestration um, the, the geological sequ sequestration of carbon uh, could add even more to that. All right, so that's January 2023. We've got 900 million dollars in the in the 10 year forecast, 900 million dollars of revenue in the forecast that balances the budget. Indeed, produ indeed produces a surplus uh, at some points in the at some points in the in the 10 year forecast being generated by by this package of bills. All right, now let's come to April 18th. Uh, 2024, with the passage of one of those bills, the carbon sequestration bill. Alaska House, the headlines in the Alaska Beacon, Alaska House seeking to boost oil and gas business approves carbon storage bill. And it describes that, it, it goes on to describe this. In Alaska, the rights to subsurface resources are owned collectively by the state's residents through the state government. The original version of the bill required minimum payments by participating companies based on the amount of carbon dioxide injected underground. Legislators, however, removed that provision and replaced it with language allowing the commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources to negotiate the financial terms of carbon deals with no minimum charge. Some funding formulas exist to pay for long-term monitoring of the injection wells. So we go from January 20, January 2023 Where's my 900 million? I mean, come on, you just wait, you wait, not even a minimum, not even a minimum is allowed. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So we go from January, 2023 of $900 million in the budget. We balance the budget, fiscal, fiscal, fiscal plan solved. Uh, as the governor said at the time, we push the costs off, off on somebody else. Alaskans don't have to pay magic 900 million. We've gone from that 900 million now to zero <laughs> minimum. Uh, uh, in uh, in the bill uh, as it's passed, and I, you know, we can. I'll talk in a moment about all the reasons why that's why that's understandable. But here's the deal: the governor in 2023 told us he his fiscal plan included a big chunk of money, nearly a billion dollars a year, out of out of this and 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 assorted other bills. Um, and now we have a bill that passes the House uh, that doesn't have even a minimum amount of revenue being generated in it. The question to the governor would be, okay, so you just blew a $900 million hole uh, in your fiscal plan for uh, uh, for that you put forward last year. How are you otherwise going to fill it? How are you otherwise going to balance the budget? Because the magic $900 million uh, just disappeared. And the response from the, the governor's office, as is the response on many things these days, is crickets, right? Nothing. No no response, no comment, no thank you, no, we may still get the money. I mean, none of that. It's just, um, yeah, well, <laughs> not too bad. That, did, that didn't happen. I mean. That was the plan, but, you know, plans change. <laughs> but but the plan, there is no plan. That's That's the point. There is no plan anymore. Um, the governor had a plan. He told us he had a plan. The plan was what one of the tenants of the plan was the $900 million that was going to come from this bill. And now that shot, uh, to all the heck, uh, because we've taken out even the minimum, not, not forget the projection of $900 million. We've taken out even the minimum. Um, and, and now the governor, and, and, and so you got a $900 million hole and the governor's just, you know, not saying well, anything about it. So it's, there is no plan. There well, is no fiscal plan. We've known that for a long, for for a while. Yeah, yeah. But each time you see one of these events happen, it just is a further nail in the coffin. You know, a governor, a governor would get out there and say, "Yep, 
ah, didn't that didn't work out, but but here's how I'm going to fill the hole uh, otherwise. He's not doing that. Uh, he hasn't done that for a long time. I mean, the sales tax, the 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 um, uh, the press conference uh, where he talked about a sales tax briefly uh, was now approaching a year ago, uh, and and he and there is no other plan. And so it's just, I mean, yes, the Democrats deserve a lot of a lot of a, 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 a lot of criticism. Yes, they voted against HAR seven. Yes. There's all sorts of, of bad things that are going on on that side. Yes, they want to increase spending. Yes, I understand. I understand all that. But this governor, governor, has a responsibility to propose balanced budgets, and the only way we're getting to balanced budgets is through PFD cuts on the backs of middle and lower income right. Alaska families. Right. The governor said we were going to do it differently. That bill that he said was going to allow us to do it differently is gone. I mean, the the, the bill's still there, but the revenue's gone. So what what's the what's the replacement plan? And and we and we well, got remember crickets. because that's he put that remember because he put the big PFD, put the full PFD up front and then said on the backside the carbon sequestration was going to make up the money. That was the whole point. So now the fallback becomes again the PFD. I mean, it's just it's that simple. Um and, and what was the justification from the legislature on removing the minimums? I don't even understand why they said that they had to do that. Well, because because the market's not fully developed, uh, we don't know what the value is. Uh, we want uh, the legislature's justification is we want uh, the development of coal. Uh, in Kevin's case, Kevin's a big uh, supporter of uh, of coal development, it, particularly in his district. Uh, we we want the development of coal. We want the development of of natural gas. That comes with carbon problems, and so carbon sequestration is really now viewed frankly, as a state service for in, in, in support of the development of those resources. And, you know, it, it, at least you might make the argument, well, if we, if we give them carbon sequestration, if we don't charge them for carbon sequestration, or we charge only, you know, a minimal amount for carbon sequestration, we're going to get the development of all these resources, and we're going to have revenues, royalty revenues from these resources. And so that's how we're going to get the revenues. But no one's even arguing that. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's just, it, it's, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like, let's give stuff away. Let's spend uh, and create all these great things for Alaskans. Let's create a great three, you know, campus university system. Let's create all sorts of other things that we, that we want in this state. Uh, but revenue, yeah, we're not going to worry much about revenue because we got this PFD. We can just keep taking more and more and more. You know, Kevin's MOAR, more. Well, that's that's exactly what's going on with the PFD. They just want more and more and more and more uh, of the PFD. And every time, you know, every time we talk about revenue, the sales tax bill, all of a sudden it's disappeared. The, the, the carbon sequestration revenues, uh, they've disappeared. I mean, revenues... <laughs> Re, re, no one cares about revenues because because all of them, all of them are, are you know, just sort of sitting there counting on the PF, PFD cuts to make up for it. They give lip service to saving the PFD, but then they do things like, you know, pushing forward on corporate tax reform, pushing forward on carbon sequestration without minimum revenues. They push forward on the very things that are supposed to give us revenues uh, without uh, without without actually going forward with those revenues. Well, it's, uh, you know, the problem with all these things that we've talked about this at the state level, at the national level and everything else is eventually the equation reaches the end, right? I mean, eventually there will be a part where there is no more zeros to add to the end of the deal. And you're like, well, I guess we've spent it all. Then what are we going to do? And instead of slowing it down now and softening the blow, we're just running full tilt boogie into it. And it's well, uh, it's it's there's no slowing down. The governor doesn't have a plan. Nobody seems to really have a plan. It, it's not it's not it's not that we're it, it's not even that we're not slowing it down, Michael. We're speeding it up by layering on additional programs on top of additional programs. Your your comment about you know how much is automatic every year just keeps going up. Um, the the amount that you know the amount of additional spending that gets layered on every year when you add more programs when you add Julie Colomb's uh, uh, child care, state child care. Uh, when you yep. add more to the university, when you add more to um, K through 12, it just keeps building up more and more and more every year. So we're, we're getting to the point faster 
And when we get to the point, we're hitting it much, much harder uh, than, 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 than we need to. And we've done it by taking away the cushion on middle and lower income Alaska families uh, in the process. So it's, it, it's, it, it, it is, it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible to see. It's horrible to see this governor who, who, you know, went around proudly saying, look, I got $900 million. Don't worry about it. We're set. Um, and when his $900 million goes down in flames, um, who's, who doesn't have anything to say. Uh, it's just, I mean, it, it is irresponsibility built on top of irresponsibility. Right. And there's just, there's just no, there's no answers. Like you said, they're not just pulling on, not pulling on the brakes. They're shoveling the coal right into the box, you know, as the train goes over the, the bridge that's out and they're like, it's going to be spectacular. Just throw more coal in. It'll be fantastic. Um, we can make that leap. Uh, Ron says, just curious. I heard that the carbon storage would be a 50 year contract. Once the carbon is put into the ground, wouldn't it be a permanent forever storage that would make our land virtually useless? I mean, it would be in the ground. It wouldn't make the land itself useless. This is deep subsurface stuff, but I mean, I mean, it's a 50 year contract, but I mean, that would have, you'd have to renew it because it can't come back out. That's the whole point. Right, Brad? I'm well, there. there. There's, there's, you know, been discussion about using carbon as a, uh, as a in, carbon injection as a, as a way of, of, of additional oil recovery. And some of the, some of the sure. views are that putting it in the cook inlet, um, particularly if you, if you're bringing it down from the slope or putting it in the cook inlet would, would enable it to be used for, uh, for oil recovery in the cook inlet. Pretty, pretty speculative, but, but there's some of that. Um, and carbon injection up on the slope, which is which is what some are talking about. Uh, again, it would be available to be used as a um, as a source of of I'm not sure what the right term is, but a source of of uh, of, of of stuff that would help move oil out. So it's right. not it's not it's not clear. It wouldn't be it wouldn't have value. But but the carbon itself, <laughs> carbon itself would be owned by uh, the person injecting it, uh, the state would merely own the space, the capacity right. in which the, the carbon's being stored. So if it was, if you, if it did have value that you could bring it out and, and have value from it, that would be the value generated for the, on behalf of the owner of the carbon, as opposed to on behalf of the state. Well, it'd be interesting to see, <clears throat> to see where that goes. Um, uh, it's a 2,800 feet minimum and the CO2 is a benign gas or also emerging industries that could use CO2 as part of some sort of green fuel. Uh, yeah. Okay. And yes, pressurized carbon does uplift. That's what they're talking about. Repressurizing re reservoirs and things like that. It gets that heavier stuff out that, you know, there's only so much natural pressure in them. And then when they start to, to slow down, you re-inject it. And uh, they do that with gas, natural gas as well, re-inject it to pump the well back up. So yeah, they would use carbon for that. Um, but anyway. again, again, the carbon itself is owned by the person yeah. who injected it. So the value of that, of using it for that purpose, um, is would go to the go to the benefit of the owner of the carbon as opposed to the as, as opposed to the state. I can see that being a little complicated, but then again, if you got a fifty year contract, I mean, you have to you have to pump a lot of carbon in there to get nine hundred million dollars a year. Out of that. <laughs> That's a that's a lot of I mean that's a that's a that's a significant lift from where they're at right now from what we're getting what three and a half billion a year right now and now they're you know from royalties and everything else and you want to carve out almost another billion dollars a year uh, in uh, carbon costs you know processing that carbon that I don't know how the math works out on that Brad well the the nine hundred million dollars was from a combination of of the forest provision, which is we were going to keep a bunch of trees going, uh, and, and they were going to absorb carbon, um, and we were going to charge for that, and then the the sequestration. So the nine hundred million dollars was a car, was a combination of those two. Um, I haven't gone back to catch up with the trees <laughs> to see where we are, uh, see where we are with those. But the last time I did check, we weren't uh, that wasn't generating a whole lot of money. Um, <laughs> And now, and now we've taken the other thing, the carbon sequestration, uh, geologic carbon se se sequestration uh, off the table in terms of a revenue source. So it's, I mean, we, 
you and I, I, I criticize the $900 million at the time as being highly speculative and being uh, highly uncertain and, and, and unlikely. And in fact, the fiscal notes that were done around that bill, around this bill yeah. and, the, and the trees bill uh, showed, zero, showed zero revenue. But, but the point is the governor told a story that his fiscal plan balanced because of the 900 million. Because, yeah. And now the 900 million is, is, is just gone. It's just vaporized. Um, and, and we have a hole, um, uh, if we want to keep the geologic, uh, right. analogies going, we have poor space into which the governor's poured nothing, uh, to try to balance the budget. Yeah. And it has no comment on any of that. I could just, Sorry, I'm still laughing about the fact that you said you haven't checked in on the trees. I could just see Brad leaning against a tree and putting his hand on the tree. How you doing, tree? Are you absorbing that carbon? Is it good? And the tree's like, yeah, Brad, the carbon's awesome. <laughs> Brad's checking in with the tree. Yeah. yeah. That's not All quite right. what I meant, but okay. Yeah, I, well, you know, I get it. I get it. Sorry. Sometimes that's how my mind works, Brad. You just you know, roll with it. Just roll with it, you know. Um, all right, so we uh, are going to jump forward here. Uh, Kevin says there are at least a dozen tree projects in the states with the Native Association that are generating millions of dollars a year for those associations. Well, good. Let's sign us up for it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Chop, chop. Wiki, wiki. Brad Keithley uh, is uh, our guest. The weekly top three continues. We're down to the third subject today, which has to do with his interview and debate with John Sims from NSTAR this last week at the Landmine. Uh, I've dropped a link in the chat room for those that want to go watch that. It's a it's a good good watch. I got through a big chunk of it yesterday, uh, but you can go take a look at it. It's over on Facebook or YouTube. But Brad, you learned some things in that debate. What's your takeaways from all that? So it was an interesting debate. I, I, Landfield did a good job moderating it. A good job balancing uh, what John Sims had to say and and what I had to say uh, in response. I, I guess I have a, a, a few takeaways. One is. The economics of, of what we're facing in the Cook Inlet are worse <laughs> even than, uh, than than what we thought. Uh, toward the end of the debate, we got into the cost of additional Cook Inlet gas supply. There's a chart that I use during the debate. We've had a piece of it on the, on the show before. A chart that I use that shows the incremental cost of additional tranches uh, of Cook Inlet gas supply. Um, and one of those... Uh, <laughs> You've got it right there. One of those uh, uh, th those charts show that the incremental cost. Yeah, that's sort of it. But the so the red, the charts up on the on the on the screen. We've talked about it before. The blue is existing Cook Inlet production, uh, or what's anticipated to come from existing Cook Inlet production. The red is is the incremental that's need needed. Um, part of that blue comes from. Uh, 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 additional Cook Inlet productions that's not yet under contract. And the red, if it comes from the Cook Inlet, comes from Cook Inlet sources that have yet to be identified. And the cost associated with those additional supplies, Cook Inlet supplies, the supplies that would be in blue uh, above what's currently contracted and the supplies that would be in red if they came from the Cook Inlet. Uh, there's an analysis done in last year by the the, the working group that showed that that the, the range of costs for some of the additional supplies is nine to thirteen dollars. And then the range of costs for additional supplies beyond that is like 15 to, to, to 24 or 25 dollars, somewhere, somewhere in that range. It's significantly higher. And what came out during the last part of the debate is John said, Oh, it's going to cost more than that. <laughs> It's going to cost to get the additional tranche above the currently contracted supply. It's going to cost more than than the range that was in the uh, that, that was in the analysis, and beyond that, it's going to cost even more than that. So, the the cost of Cook Inlet supply. One of the things that I that I one of the takeaways from the debate was the cost of Cook Inlet supply is even higher than we anticipated. Uh, that the, that's higher than than what's in the what's in the uh, what's in the analysis that makes LNG even more competitively attractive um, uh, the cost of LNG was was lower than the cost of those cook inlet incremental supplies in the first place if the cost of those cook inlet incremental supplies are going up the cost of LNG looks even more competitively attractive uh, going forward so that was 
that was one piece of warning. We're not we're not going in a direction that favors the Cook Inlet. We're going in a direction. Uh, I think I said during the debate. I recall saying during the debate. Then to John. Then why the heck are we just pressing ahead, full steam ahead with Cook Inlet? Why are we? Or I mean, with with LNG. Why are we even having this discussion about trying to trying to get incremental supplies from the Cook Inlet? John's response was, "We are pressing ahead with LNG." So, I. This this whole debate is is running away, frankly, from from incremental cook inlet supplies because of cost. Another takeaway was John had a defense of of subsidizing the cook inlet that I really hadn't heard before, hadn't seen written down before, and it was to to capture a phrase that he used: Alaska energy independence. It was we want to continue to have our state independent be independent, be supplied from Alaska sources. We don't want any of that, you know, foreign gas, foreign gas, uh, being reliant on any of that foreign gas. And a piece of that argument was a national security argument that, that you know, we've got, we've got major uh, uh, military installations up here. We don't want them being supplied by foreign, uh, uh, from foreign supplies of, of natural gas. Well, there's a couple of answers to that. One, the most likely, the nearest source of LNG is going to come from Canada. Uh, and I'm not convinced that we need to be treating Canada as a, as a foreign supply. I mean, we our defense interests are totally aligned with the, with the Canadians. Another is one the biggest producer on the planet of LNG right now is the U.S., coming from Gulf Coast sources of supply. And a lot of that LNG is coming around through the Panama Canal and going into going into Asian markets, so it's just a you know hop, skip, and a jump to to add a, Alaska to that supply chain. So if your argument is we need Alaska supplied from American sources, then then okay, we got American LNG. If we need a Buy American Act on on this supply, we've got American sources that uh, that can satisfy it. But it's but this whole argument was well, we need to subsidize the basically this argument boiled down to we need to subsidize the Cook Inlet sort of regardless of where that takes us, sort of regardless of what the costs are, uh, in order to have Alaskan sources of supply uh, available to Alaska so that we're not dependent on on foreign sources of supply. And, and even if you accept that, even if you accept that notion for a moment, right. then the next question is who pays? Right. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole discussion we've had before on the show is, why are we using PFD cuts, which would be the source of the revenue for the subsidies? Right. Why are we using PFD cuts to pay for it? So if 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 we're going to adopt this 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 notion that we need an Alaska, we need Alaska independence, independent energy in Alaska, we need to we need to subsidize the Cook Inlet to continue to have uh, uh, Alaska sources of supply to rely on. Okay, fine. And we need to have Alaska sources of supply so the military is happy. Okay, fine. Why, why are we having middle and lower income Alaska families bear that burden? It's going to be, it's going to benefit everybody. Why aren't we using a broader base revenue system to, to generate uh, those, uh, those uh, revenues that would be used to, 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 to cover, cover the subsidies. So right. it, it was, it was an interesting debate uh, in the sense that the problem's getting worse, not better. <laughs> and, right. and, 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 and here's another defense that, that we haven't talked about before, but, but we're not going to talk about who pays. I mean, it's just, we'll just assume that the, the PFD cuts will cover it because, right. you know, they cover everything else. So why not this? And it's just, I, it, it was, it was unsatisfying in the sense that those two issues were sort of left uh, dangling out there at the end. Well, this is nothing new. I mean, this is this, this idea of national security or oil independence or, you know, th those kind of things. Uh, gas, you know, gas, energy independence. I mean, it the the question that never gets asked is at what cost? It becomes protectionism. I mean, this is the whole yep. Jones Act thing and everything else, and it becomes protectionism for a specific industry. You know, when you start to ask, okay, great, it'd be great to have oil independence or gas independence, but at what cost? Is it two times? Is it three times? 
Well, great. <clears throat> so people have to leave because they can't afford to live here, but we do have at least got our own gas. I mean, kind of thing. This is the benefit of the global market is that you can find or source a cheaper source of something like that. Um, I mean, it's the whole idea of food independence. It's the same kind of thing. It would be nice and people can take some personal responsibility for that, but it doesn't pencil out on paper right now to have food independence in many areas because it's two or three times as much to produce the same amount of food as you could somewhere else and ship it up. So, I mean, while it's a novel argument, it's not new. Again, it's the protectionism of the Jones Act style stuff right now. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And and it, it sort of, I mean, there was, there was a couple of hints in there. I don't want to go too far with this, but there were a couple of hints of, of NSTAR doesn't want to be the one that's advocating for LNG. N NSTAR wants to be seen as rah, rah, Alaska, rah, rah, Cook Inlet, rah, rah, Alaska, energy independence, rah, rah. I mean, John even got into saying, you know, and I hope the, the big pipeline comes down by then. And, you know, we, when Cook Inlet finally does run out, run out we finally have, it, it was, it was NSTAR doesn't want to be seen as the one pushing for the commercially reasonable solution here. It wants to be seen as the raw, raw Alaska. And I, I can sort of understand that. If John has in the back of his mind that he wants to run, run for governor or senator someday, he doesn't want to be seen as advocating, you know, foreign sources of supply. So I can, I can, uh, I can sort of see that. There was also a hint in there, I will say, of let's protect protect Alaska producers. There was a discussion in there about a, a segment of it was let's protect protect Alaska producers and let's protect the infrastructure on the Kenai Peninsula related to those producers. And let's let's ensure that you know those people have jobs and those people have, you know, no no discussion about well there'll be jobs with an LNG plant, there'll be jobs constructing an LNG plant, but it was more let's 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 protect the industry we have um and that was and let's protect the people who are employed related to that industry that we have sort of re again regardless of cost because costs are running away from us and 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 so the protectionism was another another uh another feature of that i to me and and you can see this show up in the debate to me right. the question is just cost alaska is a high cost place right the way it is right now and who is going to pay and and how much more is the cost? I mean, that's that, those all need to be components of it. It's easy to say it doesn't matter how much it costs because government's paying until you start to ask the question of, well, who pays that? And that's where we run into the problems. This is not a new argument. It's just the question of, well, yeah, it'd be great if we had our own. But at what cost? Is it two, three, four times as much as we could have it shipped up? Is it more reliable or less reliable? I mean, there's, you know, all kinds of questions in there. Sure, it'd be nice if I could manufacture all my own stuff right here in my own backyard and do it all myself. That'd be great. But is it feasible and does it make sense? And I think that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves. Yeah, John, there was also another point in there where John was talking about the, the negotiations that they're having with the producers who might supply this incremental supply. And he said they don't want to enter into firm contracts. They, they they want to do interruptible contracts. If they have the supply, they will deliver it to us, but they don't have a firm obligation because they don't want the liability that would go with violating their firm or breaching their firm obligation and leading NSTAR to have to curtail customers. They they want to keep it on an interruptible basis. And John said that's not, you know, that that doesn't work for us. We, that doesn't work for a gas utility. We can't. We can't sit like, there you saying, why you've got to have a supply. You can't just be like, oh, you're out to this week. Okay, no problem. We'll hang out and wait, you know? Yeah. Just, just turn off your, turn off your furnace while, uh, while we're waiting for the supply to show up. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, as I say, the issue is running away from the cook inlet costs. The, the, the realization are that costs are higher. Prices would be higher. Economics would be worse for, for relying on the cook inlet. Uh, Cook Inlet producers that they're looking to uh, don't want to uh, uh, don't want to enter into firm contracts. You know, and part of the discussion uh, was uh, uh, the 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 Cook Inlet the two Cook Inlet producers were talking about Fury uh, with the Kitchen Lights uh, project and Bluecrest with the Cosmopolitan project. Uh, those two producers uh, are saying. Are, are saying in, in in their negotiations that, well, you know, royalty relief isn't enough. We really need more. Uh, Hendrick says, the Fury Project says, well, 
yeah, give me royalty relief, but I also need three hundred million dollars to help me, you know, help develop the the project. And Cosmopolitan saying, uh, Cosmopolitan, who's got an ADA loan, a loan from ADA already, who has has asked for relief on that because they can't make the payments. They're saying, hey, we need more money to develop this project also. So it's not just that costs are up. It's that they're not they're not willing to enter into firm contracts. And they're saying that that the that the subsidies that the legislature is offering in terms of royalty relief aren't enough in the first place. They're going to need additional stuff uh, in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of financing. Um, and it just the 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 storyline just keeps running further and further away from the Cook Inlet. I think we need to you know put a stake in the ground. Say we're going to bring in uh, LNG. If all of a sudden that breaks the dam and people say, okay, I'm willing to enter into firm contracts at commercially commercially attractive prices, then okay. But but we do have a shortage of Cook Inlet supply coming up. LNG is the solution to that shortage of supply. Turns out LNG also looks to be the least expensive of the alternatives for that additional supply. And so we ought to just, we ought to just get on with that and stop, you know, going in circles, waiting for, you know, something to happen in the Cook Inlet that's, that's, that, that you can't see happening out there at this point. Everybody loves it when somebody else pays for all that stuff. The, fortunately it's us that's paying for it in the long run but you're 100 right if all the indicators basically say lng is going to be the cheapest most affordable and most dependable option why continue at that point other than for your own ego or pride to say it's alaskan gas and we're getting alaskan gas well great dig it on your nickel and when you discover that big pocket then we can add that to the mix but until then you know Everybody's got to heat. Everybody's got to, you know, everybody's got to keep their, their house warm. And uh, until then, we need to find out a, a solid attainable solution. And it seems to me like the LNG is the way to go right now. And John, and John did confirm that, that LNG is flexible. I mean, you can, you can delay cargoes, you can resell cargoes. A lot of the LNG that's sold on the, on the market now is resale of, of LNG that somebody else had bought. Um, and so you can resell cargoes. There's a lot of different ways to to if there is a big find, if there is a small find in the Cook Inlet uh, at commercially reasonable prices that you can add to the mix. There's a lot of ways to create pockets in the LNG supply chain uh, to accommodate that additional supply. So it's it's it. I don't, in all honesty, other than the raw raw, we want Alaska independence. Uh, oh, and by the way, there's a national security issue along in, along in here too. Other than that, I just don't see, you know, why we're holding our breath or holding out hope for uh, for Cook Inlet supplies. The the economics don't work. the The commitments don't work. The cost uh, is is moving away from it. Uh, the shortage is is coming on uh, that LNG can solve. So we we just need to get on with it. Yeah. No, move, move ahead, move, move along, move along. Nothing to see here. This was not the deal you were looking for. Move along. Um, all right, <clears throat> Brad, uh, what are you looking at for next week real quick? So we've got uh, uh, Alaska finance or the, the legislative finance is, is presenting to the Senate and House finance committees in the middle of this week. Uh, I think House finance goes first and Senate goes second. Um, and that's going to be sort of the big numbers as the Senate releases its operating budget, sort of the big numbers of what we've got. You know, we're going to see Bert structure this, structure the, the ledge finance presentation. So, so it shows this huge deficit that we have no way of covering except through PFD cuts. And so we've got to move with, ahead with PFD cuts. And this discussion of a big PFD, you know, the Hammond PFD, all that mm-hmm. stuff, we just need to leave that in the in the rearview mirror. So yeah, that, that's what's in the week ahead. More of that. Wow. It'll be interesting. Rob catches one piece on the way out. He says one more piece. We, the producers, this is the problem with the Petro state. We, the producers of energy are entitled to cheap energy, regardless of how much it takes to subsidize it. That's true. That's what happens when you get a Petro state. All right, uh, Brad, Keith Lee. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. 
and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.